All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Trustworthy ML seminar. I'm your host, Shubha Majumdar. And today we are joined by Stephen Wu from the Carnegie Mellon University. The first hour is going to be a talk by Stephen, followed by a question answer session. We'll then run into five minute break. Then um, the next 25 minutes or so will be a participant driven discussion in the same Zoom link. Just note that this Zoom meeting is recorded, being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. So if you do not want to appear in the recording, you can uh, exit and watch the same thing on YouTube as well. But do join us in the same Zoom link at one o'clock if you want to participate in the discussion. A little bit of background about Trustworthy ML, uh, with which a lot of you are familiar uh, right now. We officially kicked off in last fall, but uh, before that, for a few weeks, we have been discussing off and on and wanted to build a community around this different streams of topics centered around Trustworthy Machine Learning. We are glad to have eight organizers right now and for um, advisors as well, who are well-known name, names in the field of trustworthy machine learning in different aspects of trustworthy machine learning. Our different activities are centered around easy access to uh, newcomers in the field, giving a platform for early career researchers through our Twitter handle and other activities. Um, the Twitter handle is a source of news and other information as well. Uh, a lot of you have been active participants in our Twitter community. Uh, that's a great thing to see um, from the point of view of our the organizers. Um, and finally, um, we are aiming to build a vibrant community of researchers and practitioners. With that in mind, we have a bunch of exciting new plans in this coming year. So stay tuned for that. Coming back to uh, the agenda of today's talk, um, the first 40 minute, as I mentioned, is going to be the talk by Stephen. During the talk, there will be um, questions that you can submit into the Zoom Q&A tool. Um, whoever is attending, please feel free to upvote or comment on others' questions as well. Um, I'll be asking Stephen those questions in the middle of his talk when he takes a pause or at the end of his talk as well. Um, when it rolls to a formal question answer session. After that, there will be a break and we are going to roll into the discussion after the break in the same Zoom link. A little bit of a little bit about Stephen and his talk before we hand it over to him. Stephen is going to talk about the topic of involving stakeholders in building fair machine learning systems. Stephen is an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science in CMU and his research focuses on how to machine learning better aligned to societal values like privacy and fairness, and also how to make machine learning more reliable. He's been a recipient of multiple awards and his research is supported by uh, different grants such as Amazon Research Award and the Mozilla Research Grant. So without further ado, Stephen, over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Just checking, uh, can you see the, hear yep. me well? Okay. Yep. Uh, all right, great. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this seminar series. It's really exciting to be a part of this uh, series and be able to really connect with people around the world in these strange and challenging times. Uh, so I know today is actually the, the ICML deadline uh, so hopefully this uh, could be a fun little break from the paper writing for many of you. Uh, and for my co-authors who might be watching this later, I, I, I want to salute to you and thank you for all the hard work. Um, so today I want to tell you a little bit about um, some of our recent exploration uh, in thinking about how we may in involve stakeholders in building uh, fair machine learning systems. Um, so I know it's a... Uh, sort of a tradition uh, for this uh, Trust ML seminar uh, that the speaker first talk a little bit about themselves. Uh, 
but let me actually first talk about uh, my collaborators uh, who are much more interesting than me uh, and have probably contributed much more to the work that I will talk about today. Uh, so the first work I will talk about today uh, is a joint work with Yaha Batchwald and uh, Chris Young. Uh, so this is a recent piece of work uh, in machine learning uh, that appeared in the recent NeurIPS. Uh, I think uh, Yaha and Chris actually will did had did a better job in presenting this at NeurIPS with their oral presentation. Uh, so make sure you, you want to may, you may want to check that out um, later. Uh, the second piece of work is uh, joint work uh, with my PhD students, Hao Fei Chen, uh, Logan Stapleton, our undergrad RAs, Ray Chi Wang, Paige Bullock, and my CMU colleagues, uh, Alec Chodachofa and Hai Zhu. Uh, and Hai Yu and I both uh, co advise Hao Fei, uh, who's the first author of this paper. Uh, Hao Fei is currently uh, graduating in the process of uh, searching for industry position. So for those who are looking, uh, make sure you look no further. Uh, uh, there's another piece of related work that I won't be able to dive into today, uh, which is a, another collaboration with some of my colleagues at Penn, uh, with uh, Chris John, Michael Kern, Seth Neal, Aaron Roth, and also my student, Logan Stapleton. Uh, so it has some technical overlap with the first work, um, but it has sort of the same theme of how we think about um, involving stakeholders uh, using different kind of algorithm methods uh, and framework. So you may notice there's a sort of a mix of machine learning and HCI work here. So HCI, for those who, who are not familiar with, uh, stand for human computer interaction. Um, so this has been sort of the emerging theme of my recent work and uh, recent collaborations. Uh, I still don't consider myself a HCI researcher, I spend most of my time thinking about technical questions around machine learning and algorithms. Uh, and most of the time spend time proving uh, formal and mathematical guarantees about these algorithms uh, around fairness and privacy issues, for example. Uh, but more recently, I, I realized no matter how hard you work on this theory or algorithmic questions, algorithm will only be part of the bigger solution, right? At the end of the day, algorithms will often need to interact with stakeholders in many of the consequential decision-making problems. Um, so it's, this sort of motivates uh, some of my recent collaborations with uh, HCI researchers and in, in public policy as well, especially Hai Yi and Alex, in thinking about the kind of interactions between humans and machine learning algorithms uh, and how we actually leverage this kind of interaction or even collaboration in building a more trustworthy machine learning system. Um, so this talk will be about fairness. Um, so as we all know, machine learning algorithms now have access to incredibly detailed information about us, uh, including our movements, our browsing history, our income and all kinds of sensitive information. And algorithms often take these personal data as input and eventually inform or make consequential decisions on people. So there's definitely concern about whether these algorithms may lead to unfair biases or discrimination against certain groups or individuals. And the machine learning community has responded with perhaps an extremely rapidly growing number of papers. So many of you may have seen this funny cartoon of histograms by Morris Hart, uh, which is by now nearly four years old. And at this point, we definitely have a rather big uh, community within machine learning uh, who are working very actively in thinking about this kind of fair, fairness related issues uh, in the use of machine learning. So uh, if you look at this growing body of work, uh, and in particular, if you look at the kind of technical work in this area, uh, it's a rough characterization, not, not 100%, uh, but much of the technical algorithmic work in this area tend to first formulate fairness related algorithmic problems, and then tend to work with predefined notions of fairness. So I think there are lots of important values doing that. Uh, we are formalizing fairness intuition and placing these societal issues on firm mathematical foundations 
And it's important to understand this relationship across different notions with different problems and what can and cannot be done under these different formulations or constraints. Um, but while there are values in taking this approach, um, there's definitely still a gap uh, between these algorithmic fairness approaches or notions and the fairness no viewpoints and uh, principles by relevant stakeholders who may not have the kind of technical training you expect uh, from for, um, understanding machine learn how machine learning will work. Um, so this is especially an issue uh, when algorithms often don't actually make the decisions directly, but rather they, they provide predictions to inform decision makers to make the final decisions on people. Um, so this sort of motivates uh, a line of work uh, that my collaborators and I are trying to work on. So we try to bridge this gap by really thinking about whether we can have algorithms working with stakeholders or domain experts so that the resulting ML system can reflect the kind of fairness viewpoints uh, or principles of the stakeholders uh, or domain experts. Uh, so I, I would put it up front and say that we are definitely far from obtaining a, a satisfactory answer to this question. So we are only at the beginning of trying to take this approach and thinking about this question. There are so many uncertainty and so many unknown of what we can achieve. Uh, so mainly here today, I want to share some of our explorations in this space uh, and really share some of the lessons we learn in thinking about these kind of questions. Um, so this talk will roughly uh, have two parts. Uh, so the first part uh, will be thinking about more of a theoretical approach uh, in answering this question. Uh, so we will first talk about an algorithmic framework that's try to interact with humans or human auditors as we would define uh, to enforce a stronger notion of individual fairness and sort of go beyond the traditional group fairness notion that's more prevalent in the fairness literature. Um, and the second part uh, is, I view it as sort of taking a somewhat complementary uh, approach uh, that sort of, you know, think hard about some of the assumption you might make in the first theoretical work uh, and take a harder look at it and in a real world context. So the second part, we will take an HCI approach and thinking about what sort of nuances or subtleties that may come up in implementing this kind of algorithmic framework in a real world context. So the context we'll focus on in the second part uh, is uh, in, related to child welfare systems where there has been predictive tools that to deploy to help uh, predict child maltreatment risk. Uh, okay, so let me begin with the first part, which is uh, again, theory, uh, mostly a theory uh, piece of work, uh, but we do wanna think about how algorithms may work with a human uh, in, in order to achieve some kind of strong fairness criteria that is going beyond the kind of predefined group fairness notion that we are more accustomed to in the, the broad literature. So if you look at the fair machine learning literature in general, uh, most of the work uh, sort of takes a, what, what we call a statistical group fairness approach. Uh, so uh, this, this is gonna be like a, maybe an over summarization. There are definitely exceptions to this, but. A lot of work follow what you, you might think of as a pretty simple two-step recipe. So the two-step, in the first step, you, you first pick some sort of meaningful statistics related to fairness that you might care about. And usually people will think about classification. So this is kind of statistics about classification problem. Uh, for context, you can think about whether uh, some predictive algorithm is decide to approve someone alone or not as a form of classification problem. And then in the second step is very simple. You basically want to ask whether this kind of statistic is roughly equalized across groups. So here groups are roughly uh, identified by certain attributes called protective or sensitive attributes, such as uh, the groups that are identified by someone's uh, race or gender, uh, if you like income and other sort of related uh, issues that uh, there might be fairness concerns about. Uh, so let me give you two examples. It's not important, the details are not important, uh, but these are the kind of notion people like to think about in the literature. Uh, the, the one example is what people like to call statistical parity or demographic parity. Uh, the idea is simple. It basically wants to equalize 
uh, acceptance rate uh, or positive classification rates across groups. Uh, so in a long example, you can think about the acceptance rate should be equalized across different racial groups. Um, uh, perhaps a more refined notion people have thought about uh, is the equality of false positive of, or false negative rates, uh, sometimes summarized as e equalized odds or equal opportunity. Uh, so basically you, you wanna constrain the, the classifier, uh, the long approval algorithm to not substantially make more mistakes on one of the groups. The kind of mistakes you, you want is you don't want to falsely reject someone who's credit worthy in certain subgroup much more than what you have done for the other group. Uh, so in, in a way, this is somewhat more refined because you actually think about the merit of the outcome in this case. Uh, so we, we won't dive into these notions in details. Um, uh, there are definitely pros and cons about these concepts. There, there are definitely fairness, intuition, each of them uh, are a capturing, but definitely neither of them capture everything about fairness. Uh, but I wanna point out one issue you might think of when you think about this general approach of statistical group fairness. Uh, so one issue is uh, a phenomenon which is interestingly coined in uh, one of our recent work or prior work uh, called fairness gerrymandering. Uh, it's a joint work uh, with Michael Kern, Seth New, and Aaron Roth. Um, so I'm gonna illustrate it with a very simple toy example. Uh, so suppose there are more than one sense of attributes, which is just to say there are more than one way to identify groups in the populations. Uh, in this case, there are race and gender. Um, so what you can do, and this is what a lot of literature would do is, you're gonna enforce a kind of statistical group fairness constraint like statistical parity or equalizing false positive rates across uh, race and gender separately. Um, and you might obtain some sort of classification algorithm and let's say some sort of long approval algorithm that accepts, uh, in this case, the circled individuals in this uh, two by two grid. And if you look at race and gender separately, uh, the acceptance rate or maybe even the false positive rates are roughly equal across these groups because it's roughly equal across columns and rows. But if you start looking at finer grain uh, subgroups, such as the blue uh, female or, or, the, or the green male, uh, no individual is actually accepted or the false positive rate, of, uh, false negative rate could be much higher. So uh, the idea is coming sort of from the, uh, you know, in, in, in redistricting uh, similar to how gerrymandering can manipulate district boundaries. The classifiers can actually induce different kinds of decision boundaries that appear to be fair on each high level or macroscopic group, uh, but somehow severely violate this kind of fairness constraint or criteria once you look over to more refined subgroups. Uh, that is, they are defined by intersection or combination of these protected attributes. Okay, so, so this is one issue about group fairness. Um, and there's a natural fix to it, which is uh, you, you don't just ask for this kind of criteria for this high level macroscopic groups. You try to actually achieve this kind of criteria for a wide family of subgroups. So you might think about different kind of intersectional subgroups of certain size defined by a list of attributes you might care about and enforce this kind of criteria such as statistical parity equalize odds or even calibration for large family groups. So some of our prior work uh, and also in conjunction with Hub Johnson, uh, Kim, Weingo and Rothblum have tried to tackle this kind of questions. Uh, so we will talk about this algorithm, this piece of uh, algorithm approach today. I think it technically is quite interesting, uh, but I wanna think about perhaps a more basic or more fundamental question. Uh, even by taking this kind of refined subgroup fairness approach, uh, we are still taking this kind of statistical notion as our fairness notions and work with them, uh, which are the kind of notion we, we come up with uh, by computer scientists like, like me, uh, who think hard about the problem, but we have very little experience with what's happening with the real world context. 
So ideally, we, we also want to think about how we can actually go beyond this kind of predefined statistical group notions, uh, which this kind of line of attack of thinking about subgroup fairness won't actually resolve. Uh, but people have thought about this question actually even earlier. Uh, so uh, one of the seminal work that sort of kickstarts this literature of algorithmic fairness uh, is this piece of work called, uh, that sort of defined individual fairness by Dwork, Hart, Pitassi, Weingo, and, and Zemo. Uh, at a high level, it's, it's a very simple idea. Uh, you try to make sure that uh, the algorithm is treating similar individuals similarly uh, without explicitly thinking about group memberships. Um, so slightly more formally, uh, you can think about there may be a task specific similarity metric that's really relevant to the kind of domain or context you care about. Uh, but those who are more mathematically inclined, you can think about this as just a function that takes a pair of individuals, uh, denoted as a pair of X, and map it to some positive or non-negative numbers that determine how close two individuals might be. Um, and uh, usually we'll think about some sort of randomized classifier uh, or some sort of decision rule that maps these kind of individuals to some sort of probability. So you, for now, you can think about this uh, classifiers either producing some sort of risk score or some sort of soft decision that is not exactly binary, uh, but it could take on some probability value between zero and one. And what individual fairness is asking for formally is that for any pair of individuals, uh, let's call it xi, xj. So these are sort of attributes that describe these two individuals. And what you want is that if the task specific similarity metric, think these two individuals are similar relevant to the task. Uh, so we try to be general for now. Um, then the decision maker or the classifier should not provide very different predictions or decisions for those two individuals. So formally, it just means uh, the difference in your prediction of decisions cannot be much further away, much larger, or you have to be upper bounded by the similarity measure across these two individuals. Okay. So, um, so there's obviously two advantages that sort of we circumvent the, the kind of issues you, you might have uh, with the general statistical group fairness approach. Uh, so first of all, this is really thinking about fairness, reasoning about fairness at an individual level. So you sort of prevent uh, the kind of fairness gerrymandering phenomenon that may happen. And moreover, this is perhaps very general as well. Uh, this this task-specific similarity metric is actually able, in, in principle, able to embed a lot of social context that you might think of about the task specific uh, or this real world domain you may have. So it depends on what kind of problem you might think of, this D, this metric D can in, embed many of the contextual information you care about that is maybe going way beyond the kind of statistical notion like statistical parity or equality of false positive rates. Uh, so in a way, it, it, it seemed to allow you to go beyond this kind of predefined notions of fairness. Uh, but because of the generality of, of course, they also bring up some of the bottleneck. Um, at least the, conceptually, there's a, the, a major bottleneck in actually using or oper operationalize this kind of notion. Uh, it's, for most of domains uh, we think of, uh, in fact, I actually don't really know any domain uh, in which this, similarity metric D is explicitly written down. So, uh, so this kind of metric is almost never specified um, to begin with. So if I want to actually think about this and enforce it in my ML system, I don't know how to actually start with some similarity metric D, which is a, a class of function that is mapping potential high dimensional attribute to some real number. It's, it's just a hard object to think about. Um, so, so because of that, I think, uh, the individual fairness literature hasn't grown as fast as the group fairness literature because it's, it's just harder to just pick up this and then start solving this for different kind of algorithmic problems you might care about. Um, so the first piece of work I, I described here, we try to get at this issue. Um, and the idea we want to leverage here is 
maybe the, the metric is never written down, but what we try to rely on is there are stakeholders or domain experts who may have strong intuition about this kind of similarity information. And one of the goal we may have is, can we actually build some sort of interactive algorithm that interact with some sort of human and receive this kind of fairness feedback to actually enforce this kind of individual fairness notion. Um, so the approach we take in this work uh, is to sort of introduce the idea of a human auditor. Uh, so uh, one intuition behind this is the initiating the complete metric that measure the similarity across all pairs of individuals may be difficult. I'm not even sure that's possible for, for, many, for many people who know the domain but are less quantitatively trained. But oftentimes people who are familiar with the, the domain have the strong intuition to, to allow them to perhaps detect the kind of fairness violation that come in place. So, so this intuition is that maybe enunciating the metric is hard, but detecting unfairness may be easier. Um, so, so we want to actually take advantage of this kind of um, unfairness violation or fairness violation feedback and use algorithm to work with this feedback to actually enforce uh, this kind of uh, on, uh, individual fairness notions. Okay, so slightly more formally, so the way we think about the, how the auditor works is that the auditor will periodically check in with the underlying class of classifier algorithm uh, in a way that the auditor will, will start looking at a set of decisions made by the algorithm in the past, in the recent past. Let's say there are K individuals and the algorithm provide sort of K decisions. An auditor uh, will look at this hopefully small number of decisions, like we tend to think of K as roughly small, a small constant, and examine these decisions and at the end of the day, try to identify if there is any fairness violation, uh, which is defined by pairs of individuals among these K individuals, uh, so that uh, the predictions made by the algorithm, uh, made, the prediction made on these pair individuals have a very large difference that is, so, is, is substantially larger by the metric or the similarity measure across these two individuals. I apologize for the typo here. This H should be pi here. So the point is that the, the pair of decisions may have a large difference that is larger than what is allowed by individual fairness, which is uh, the, sim the similarity measure across this pair of individuals. Uh, but here we actually allow a little bit of slack. So, so we, we want the, the auditor to maybe not exactly identify the pair that, you know, the sort of borderline violating individual fairness, but as soon as it's substantially violating individual fairness, uh, we want the auditor to catch it. But another important property that uh, we care about here is the auditor actually doesn't need to enunciate this quantity uh, D of X, I, X, J. So uh, the, the auditor never has to actually write down explicitly the numeric measure about how far this individual should be uh, in comparison to how far the difference of the decisions made by the algorithm. Let me pause here in case there are clarification questions. Uh, for longer questions, maybe I will put it uh, after the talk. If anyone, okay, so we do have a question uh, from Vijayant. Cool. Uh, let's make Vijayant a panelist. Uh, so Vijayant, you might see a little bit of delay and then feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. This is on the YouTube. Uh, um, sorry, it's a question from Zoom. I think he asked to all panelists. Yeah, he's right. joining. Yeah, feel yeah. free to speak up. <clears throat> yes, uh, quick question, you know. Um, Yep. At this point of time, are we assuming that the auditor, we're replacing the, you know, the uh, D, X, Y, X, J, we're saying it's undefined, the distance norm is undefined between yeah. individuals, and we're saying we're replacing it with auditor. Uh, maybe you would talk about this in the talk. Are we assuming that the auditor will have no biases? Like, will it be objectively better than, let's say, you know, some arbitrary definition of D? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I would say D still exists, but nobody is able to write it down. Uh, so the auditor won't be able to write it down, but uh, it's able to detect uh, a violation of this form in this inequality form. Uh, but you asked a very good question. What if the auditor, they have in mind, the D is already some sort of, uh, may already encode some sort of fairness biases. Uh, our, our framework in, in this part doesn't actually address that. It's assuming this D is embedding some sort of, you know, a well agreed upon uh, fairness metric. Uh, but in the second part, I do wanna talk about how this might differ for different stakeholders or different domain experts. That's a great question. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, let me keep moving on. Okay, so, so we're gonna take this auditor model uh, and define a learning question. Uh, so it's just, some, it's just a way to introduce how in, the interaction happened between the, the machine learning algorithm and the auditor. So online learning really just, uh, it's, a, it's not teaching a course on Coursera. It's just mean some sort of sequential decision, decision making process. So you can imagine you are deploying some sort of system that's making decisions over time. Uh, so here we're gonna index time with rounds. So from round T from one to capital T, uh, the machine learning algorithm or what, or what we call learner uh, will use some sort of classifier uh, and make decisions or predictions on K individuals. Um, and periodically uh, the, at the end of each round, uh, the auditor will examine these set of decisions made on these K individuals and try to find whether there's a fairness violation or not. So usually the kind of fairness violation will, will take a form of a pair. So if uh, the, the auditor thinks to any two individual is somewhat close, but yet the, the classifier is making very different decisions on the pair individuals, uh, the auditor will flag it. Uh, but the auditor will only flag one of them when there are multiple of them. Okay, so there's one of the feature of our model. And at the end of the day, after a while, uh, the, the algorithm may also observe some sort of labels. And we think of this as some sort of classification problem, but the framework can also work with other kinds of problems. It will also make sense. Uh, but here we'll focus on classification. So uh, here each individual may have some sort of labels that got realized, which is what the pi is trying to predict, uh, which uh, will incur what we call misclassification loss. Uh, it's essentially, measuring the expected difference between the prediction, the probabilistic prediction and the actual realized label. Yeah. So uh, you should just think of it as somewhat standard and thinking about how we measure uh, the difference, the loss when we use prediction and we, we penalize it with the absolute loss. Okay. So uh, we are not the first one in thinking about how to go around the necessity of having a metric in for individual fairness, there has been uh, prior work in thinking about this question. Uh, so notably uh, one of the piece of work uh, that's very close to ours uh, by Gillen, uh, Joan, Kearns and Roth uh, also introduced this kind of idea of auditor, uh, but they had to make a rather strong assumption. To, so this metric or similarity measure D has to take on some, some sort of like linear form metric called Mahananobis distance. So you assume that in the feature representation, the, the, the distance measure is somewhat like a, some sort of linear function or made in some matrix form, uh, which I view as a very strong assumption. And in some of our empirical studies, I, I, we, we do observe this kind of linear like assumption is, is broken. Uh, and also they require the auditor to, to catch uh, all violations uh, in each round, this small technical difference. Uh, and, Eventual and also had a similar paper, but they think about how to actually learn the metric. So, so in our work, we never we, we don't try to learn the metric specifically, uh, but this work is trying to actually learn the metric by asking this kind of pairwise comparison, also distant queries for, across individuals. So the learning algorithm here, the goal is to learn the metric. We'll be asking domain experts or questions like, here are two individuals, uh, tell me a number D uh, for between these two individuals, how close should they be? So we really require asking this kind of numerical distance queries, uh, which we think are also somewhat a strong assumptions um, because 
uh, we find it that maybe a lot of people will find it hard to enunciate this kind of quantitative measure. Um, so again, this is uh, there's a small technical difference between how we relax from one of the prior work by uh, Gill and Jung, Kearns and Roth. Um, so let me dive into a little bit of technical details. I, I don't want to go full blown on the technical details, but uh, at a high level, we're trying to solve some sort of bi-criteria objective, which is a common theme in many of the fairness work. Uh, so there's some learning objective, the natural learning objective, in this case is a classification loss uh, you might care about. Uh, and also maybe there's fairness loss you, you might also be concerned about. In this case, it will be to sort of number of rounds uh, with an identified fairness violation. Right. So you would like to deploy a learning algorithm or policy so that over time that it doesn't commit or violate too many of the individual fairness uh, while interacting with the auditors. Uh, so, uh, so since we're talking about online learning, so there's typically you will talk about regret. Uh, you, know, you usually want to compare the performance of your algorithm uh, with respect to a, a set of benchmark policy. So in this case, uh, we're going to think about uh, comparing with a set of what we call fair policy according to this individual fairness notion, where they always make sure that the, when making decisions on pair, a pair of individuals, it doesn't violate uh, this kind of distance measure on every pair individual. Um, and we want to make sure that while not committing too many of this kind of individual fairness violation across time, we also wanna be competitive in terms of our misclassification loss uh, compared to the best policy uh, you may have in, in this color fair policy. Uh, so I'm omitting some details here. Uh, so you can see this, the set of fair policy benchmark class here is uh, required you exactly make, make sure that the distance or the difference between the decisions cannot be bigger than the distance measure on every pair of individuals. Uh, but we, we can relax that to also have the benchmark policy to relax and have a little bit of slack as well, but I won't go into that. Um, so um, I'm gonna give you a very rough idea of how our algorithm work, uh, which I think is a pretty nice feature because we actually provide a form of reduction. Uh, so we basically provide a reduction based algorithm so it means the following. Uh, so what we're trying to solve is some sort of online learning or sequential decision-making problem, uh, trying to solve classification problem online while also want to ensure fairness in the long run by interacting with some auditor. So this is a somewhat a, a different uh, learning protocol from the typical online learning framework. Um, so we might have to redesign a lot of that different algorithm for different policy class or different classifier you, you might have in mind. Uh, but if you remove the keyword to fairness from the red, red box, uh, this problem is actually a really well studied problem in machine learning literature. So online learning or online classification, this problem has been studied for decades, right? So in short, you can just remove sort of the fairness component. You can think about this as uh, in each round, the learner is trying to deploy some kind of classifier uh, on, on the set of example, and whether you match a label or not will determine whether you, you have some loss. So for the blue box, the problem has been well studied for decades and you can think about tons and tons of algorithms for solving this. So our idea is that, well, we're solving a new learning problem with the additional criteria of fairness, but we don't want to actually redesign all the different algorithms whenever we pick up a new policy kind of class pie. Right. We don't want to do a separate thing for a linear classifier or decision tree or what, what have you. Uh, ideally, we, we take any algorithm you have for the blue box. It can turn it around to actually solve the, the problem, the R problem in the right box. So this is basically our main result. Um, so we basically assume, you know, given a policy class pi, uh, you have some sort of online classification method. Uh, with some sort of regret guarantee, meaning uh, by running this out with them, you will actually match the best loss you could have achieved up to some, some sublinear function of T, okay? Um, and 
our reduction method can sort of think of it as a wrapper around this sort of black box online classification method uh, and achieve two criteria. First of all, we'll make sure that the classification loss has regret bounded by the same regret bound uh, given by this black box method. So whatever regret rates you may have for the black box method, uh, you will inherit it. And also you're you are able to bound uh, this kind of uh, number of rounds of fairness violations uh, identified by the auditor uh, across time. Uh, also be, you're able to bound it by this regret bound. Okay, so you can basically take any black box method which uh, can come from this broad literature of online learning to solve this problem. Uh, for those uh, who may be somewhat familiar with it, there, there are examples of this kind of online learning algorithm uh, like one, one of them is called exponential weights or multiplicative weights, uh, which is uh, some, somewhat like a, the first algorithm you would think of a try, but may not always be computationally efficient. Um, and there are variants of these kind of algorithms called follow the perturbed leader, which is a, a somewhat a computationally efficient way to implement this kind of online learning algorithm. We won't go into details, but you can think about in these cases, you can actually replace a regret bound by something roughly scaling uh, with square root of T. So if you if making a decision over the horizon of capital T, uh, you can make sure the classification loss or the number of fairness violations is bound by root T. Uh, so the reduction idea is kind of simple. Um, basically we are constructing a single hybrid loss function. Uh, we're basically calling it the Lagrangian loss function. And we're gonna feed this loss function into this black box algorithm, uh, okay? Uh, so in each round, uh, whenever you have a fairness violation, uh, so that just means if the, the deployed classifier is incurring some, some fairness violation on some pair, you can define a somewhat hybrid Lagrangian loss function Lagrangian is just motivated by this idea of constraint optimization, even though we don't have explicit constraints here. Uh, that sort of combine the original classification loss in my care about. And on top of that, you actually have what we call a fairness penalty. Basically, we multiply the difference between the decisions put on these pair of individuals identified by the auditor, multiplied by some large constant C. So we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then we take the, the sum, weighted sum of these laws. And remember, this is a bi-criteria problem. So you, you not only want to minimize the classification loss, you also want to minimize the fairness penalty because you, want, you don't want to actually incur, incur too many fairness violations over time. Um, and what we do is actually, you know, we're going to feed this hybrid Lagrangian loss function uh, to the black box method. And we provide some sort of regret preserving reductions. So whenever we feed this hybrid Lagrangian loss function to the black box method, we can actually turn it around into a, some sort of online classification problem uh, where the, the problem is basically specified by a sequence of uh, label examples uh, with some of like, uh, with, with some of the labels that we have to uh, come up with by taking into account what the fairness penalty look like. But basically this, is, this will be the, the same form of input that the black box algorithm would expect. So you can just run your algorithm by turning this hybrid loss function into uh, a sequence of classification example and run the black box. Uh, let me finish the regret analysis real quick and maybe take some questions. There's a, there's a bulk of uh, classification, uh, bulk of the technical result. So again, we have this uh, hybrid Lagrangian loss that combine both, both criteria we care about. And the proof is somewhat like a potential argument. I'm only gonna show the rough idea, right? So uh, one idea about how you prevent the algorithm for, for violating loss of fairness uh, violation over time is to think, think about the fact that whenever the auditor finds a fairness violation, okay, uh, the auditor will be able to incur a constant instantaneous regret in this round. Uh, as long as we set the C sufficiently large, larger than one over alpha. This is because if you think about a benchmark class, which is a fair policy, 
uh, that never actually incurred any of this fairness penalty or fairness uh, violation. Uh, the fairness penalty term is always zero uh, for the, the fair for a fair policy. So this part directly contribute to the loss, the regret loss uh, to the to for computing this hybrid loss function. Okay. Um, so this the last point is, you know, when you actually run this regret minimization black box, you with respect to Lagrangian loss, you have some regret rate that's sublinear in T. And, and this is basically, there's some two competing forces here. One is that the algorithm needs to make sure that over a horizon T, the total number of fairness violation cannot grow linear in T. And yet whenever there's a fairness violation that occur, there'll be a constant regret. So if there is lots of lots of linear in T number of fairness violations, uh, there will be a linear number of mistakes However, that cannot happen because the black box algorithm makes sure that the total regret over all time cannot be scaling linear in T. So in a sense that the regret bound directly bound the number of fairness violations you may have. So let me pause here because that was a lot of technical contents in case uh, there are questions in the chat. Uh, and then again, maybe we can take clarification question for now since we are running a little behind. Um, Um, Luis, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Luis. Hi, hi, uh, hi Stephen. Uh, thank you for this uh, yeah, first part. So I, I, I just wanted to check in on the D that appears yeah. every now and then. So whether it's the auditor who kind of probes or whether it's some uh, automated way to, to assess similarity. Uh, and I just wanted to check what your perspective is on on high 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 dimensional x. So the way I understand, we would have to apply the the d somewhere in the input space, so or some similarity between what goes into the model. And um, I, I would argue that so next to what I posted that it, for high d data, I think when you do use L, L1 or any type of norm. Um, it's it has some really weird behavior in high dimensions, and probably the same yeah. would go for the auditor, right? So the auditor also has difficulties if this high dimensional input to to decide is this right. similar or not. How how would you approach this? Yeah, so uh, we'll get to that in the second part of the talk. This is a great question. So maybe let me not dwell on that too much. But the short answer to for your first part of the question is this is not an automated process. This is like you should think of it as like the strong human intuition that they can enunciate. Uh, but this is a strong assumption. Uh, and we have to check that in a real, in a real domain with, with actual people. Um, so in this, uh, the high dimensional is the issue. And let me get to that in the second part. Um, uh, since we're running a little bit behind in time, um, I'm gonna skip the fairness generalization part, which is just to say that the under stochastic Assumptions, uh, you can also use the algorithm to learn a policy that is gonna satisfy this kind of individual fairness notions on most pairs drawn from the population. Okay, but let me summarize uh, some of the theoretical ideas so far, right? So, so this work is really about enforcing individual fairness by interacting with an auditor. Uh, and we, we, we want to claim, uh, we would like to claim this is some form of easy auditing. There's no complex numerical queries that need to be asked about the auditor. And the auditor only need to report a single fairness violation whenever they see one. Uh, and we want to claim that this approach is general because we don't need to make any parametric assumptions on, on D, on the metric. And we don't need to specifically work with any predictor class because we have a reduction. Uh, approach so you can take any online classification method and turn it into an algorithm in our in our setting um, but uh, maybe this is related to what louis just asked uh, is really uh, are you thinking about this as easy auditing or not so so how easy it is is actually elicits this kind of fairness feedback uh, when data might be high dimensional and people may have bias and cognitive limitations so this might be a nice transition to actually think about uh, the second part of this talk, uh, which 
uh, in flavor will be very different because the first part may tend to be a bit more technical and theoretical. Uh, the second part is really about going into a real domain and talk to people who, who are affected by this domain. So, so we wanna think about you know, how, how easy or hard it is to solicit or elicit this kind of fairness notions in particular fair, individual fairness notions from real stakeholders in a child welfare context. So um, I myself is actually new to this uh, context of child welfare and I have to give uh, lots of credits to Alex uh, Chodichova who, who did all her groundwork in building the relationship and understanding domains and also introducing us to the relevant stakeholders. Uh, and when I come to learn about it, it's actually a highly consequential domain. So each year over 7 million children are included in referrals to child protective services agencies, alleging child maltreatment or look next. So there are lots of children are actually impacted by this kind of services. Um, and this kind of process actually usually sent to some form of social workers or cost screeners who get to decide whether to screen in or, or incoming referral reports for investigation, right? So uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and in general, it's actually a very challenging and difficult problem for the, the cost screen. So it's very difficult to determine whether you screen in on some child, potential child maltreatment report or not. Okay, so traditionally, this is a, mostly a human driven process where a neighbor or some teacher will, will report some kind of child maltreatment case to uh, uh, child welfare agencies. Uh, so the call screener or social worker will receive some kind of report and that they will review it uh, from the call and decide whether to investigate the case. Right? So, uh, so more recently in the last couple of years, uh, people have been introducing algorithm or predictive modeling into this pipeline. So now when they review this kind of reported cases, uh, they also tend to work with algorithm generated risk score. Okay, so, so these are predictive models that are using historical data. So, so this is already uh, maybe depends on the history, there might be some sort of biases, but they use this kind of historical data to sort of predict whether some child reported child maltreatment cases is high risk or low risk. And in conjunction, they decide whether to screen in or not, or, or to investigate the case. Or not. So our case study, uh, the study we did is most related to the Allegheny County uh, Family Screening Tool, uh, also called AFSD, basically here locally at Pittsburgh. Um, and since uh, August 2016, they've been using some sort of predictive tool uh, for, for this sort of child abuse uh, cost screening within the county. Um, so this piece of work that uh, we submitted uh, at Kai uh, is basically trying to build some sort of elicitation framework that you can, in the context of this talk, you can think of it as really get, take a really hard look how hard or it is easy it is to get the kind of feedback in the theoretical framework in the first part. Okay, so uh, so the first thing we built, uh, so I have to give the credit to Hao Fei, who is a very talented uh, builder, who built an in interesting interactive interface that allows stakeholders to express their fairness notions at different levels, at group levels, subgroup levels, and also individual levels. Uh, so we mostly will focus on individual level for this talk. And also there's an associated interview protocol that further probes stakeholders reasoning behind your elicited notions. So there's a follow-up interview per procedure to really ask them why they make certain choices. And this study is really providing some sort of in-depth interview with 12 participants. It's not a very large pool, but the advantage is that we can actually go very deep in, in interacting with these participants. Uh, they come from roughly two groups of stakeholders, uh, including the parents who may interact with this AFST uh, tool or the social workers with the relevant training. Um, so I will mostly thinking of, think about the individual interface, uh, individual fairness interface uh, within this framework. So what we would do uh, is to present this kind of individual case, basically report a case. These are hypothetical uh, due to privacy reason. We, we can't really show the actual private data, uh, but we basically show individual reported case, uh, which can be 
view here, like this card showing the slide. Uh, so critically, you, you, we can quickly pay attention to some basic info, like whether this, what age is this child in, gender and race, uh, information about their parents. Uh, and more importantly, you might care about the alleged perpetrator, like if there's some demographic information about the alleged perpetrator. Uh, and whether there's previously report uh, referral history about this child. Uh, and also there's some socioeconomic uh, information relevant to this uh, family. Uh, so here we, we don't actually have access to the actual family of income, but we will you know, take the sort of the medium income level in the region where the child lives in. Okay. And also similarly for the unemployment rate, which sort of give you a background information about the family. So I wanna quickly revisit Louis' point here. The predictive system used in Allegheny County, actually using the number actually way more than this. Actually the number actually is they use is in the order of hundred. Uh, but here we are only able to show roughly 10 or 20 to the participants. Uh, mostly because of this kind of cognitive overload. If we throw them a hundred attributes, they would be very hard, hard to, for them to actually reason about this kind of individual fairness viewpoint. So already we are performing some kind of projection, which uh, I wanna come back to this point later in a few slides. So what we build as part of the interface, actually the kind of uh, individual and fairness interface, that sort of asks the kind of question you might expect in the previous part uh, of this theoretical framework. Basically, whether they, they can see unfairness or identify unfairness whenever they see one. So we're gonna have this case by case view presented to the stakeholder, social worker or parents. And they're gonna decide based on the limited information they have, uh, how the algorithm should treat these pair individuals, uh, sort of aligned with the individual fairness notion. Uh, so they can get to choose whether the algorithm maybe should equally prioritize or somewhat treating these two cases the same. Uh, or they should prioritize case A over case B or the other way, but they might also opt out and say they are not comfortable answering and maybe they have no opinion. So they have a list of options they can have. Uh, so we will present them with a list of cases and ask them about feedback. Uh, the first finding we have, which is also already kind of interesting, uh, is that among almost all of the pairwise comparison we presented to these stakeholders, uh, they almost never agree on the same decisions. So this is already a strong indication in the theoretical framework we might wanna propose, which is only about one stakeholder. So there's not an issue of disagreement. Uh, so there are lots of interesting information and high behind it. And one common theme across it is you know, there are only five pairs, five case pairs uh, in which there's you know, a, a majority agreement. Um, in, in this case, this comparison number six actually, uh, all the participants actually have a strong agreement. Basically they decide that uh, because one of the child has a more serious allegation, uh, they think that one of the case should, have, should be actually be prioritized. Uh, so one of the powerful thing about some of this uh, qualitative interview is that not only can you collect this kind of responses and realize there's lots of disagreement, you can also think about what leads to agreement or disagreements over time. Um, so in one of the cases, uh, this is one of the quotes we, we obtained from the interviews. Uh, this person said, I think for me immediately, what gets me prioritized B over A is allegation type. So allegation type really just stand out much more as a, an attribute uh, and maybe even overlook some other attributes, some other differences. And for this person, uh, they think allegation type should be prioritized over age. Uh, so that's the first thing. I was, the first thing I would, uh, I would screen and I don't really think I have to look at age anymore. So once they realize one of the allegation type is so much more serious, um, this person just decide not to actually take a look at other attributes, which is kind of interesting. So there could be one attribute that stand out so much that the person may, may actually overlook uh, some of the other information. Um, they also 
some example of contentious pairs, uh, basically one kind of disagreement arise uh, uh, from the fact that there is age differences, but it may or may not be a sufficient reason to prioritize one of the cases. So one social worker would say, like now the only thing that's different is the age. Uh, it doesn't really feel right to say one should be prioritized over the other necessarily. I don't really think age should make a difference. Uh, but a different social worker will, will really uh, disagree with that and, and think that uh, the 12 year old is able to say what's happening easier than the four year old because the 12 year old will have a better idea what's wrong and right uh, than a four year old. So because the, the 12 year old will be able to articulate better, uh, they really think that the agency should prioritize the resources over to the younger child. Um, another thing that I think is very interesting related to this cognitive limitation of how um, people- Steven, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, just a heads up that it's one o'clock. So um, it would be great if you could- uh, Yeah, this is the last two slides. Great, yeah. thanks. Yeah, so the last part about this empirical finding is that uh, because there's only limited information presented uh, to in the interface, uh, some social workers tend to construct stories based on the available information. Right. So uh, one of the social workers tried to reconstruct what sort of abuse was happening behind the scene by little limited information. So even though we presented this low dimensional information, somehow the, the thought process behind it tend to go beyond these kind of information. Uh, let me quickly wrap up some of this empirical finding uh, since I'm uh, out of time. Uh, so obviously there's lots of disagreement you might encounter. Uh, there's prior work that tend to deal with that using what I call preference aggregation, but I don't think it really solved the problem in a comprehensive way. And in particular, it overlooks some of the reasoning behind this disagreement. Uh, there's also cognitive limitation in how human might interact with these kinds of systems. Um, but to wrap up, I, I think there's still interesting uh, reflection between these two relatively different piece of work. Uh, so the, the theoretical framework is thinking about if we can make this strong assumption, there's a strong human auditor that can reliably provide this kind of feedback, you can get approvable algorithms. Uh, at the same time, we, we can overlook the kind of practical nuances, uh, which can, we can come from disagreements and cognitive limitation. So this kind of theoretical framework is still have to face this kind of subtlety and nuances in real context. Um, and at the end, I, I think uh, perhaps to in closing in the child welfare context and in many domains, uh, algorithmic predictions are, are not decisions. So they often inform human decisions making. So uh, we can't just really think about algorithmic fairness and we have to think about the humans that interact with the algorithms in deriving these decisions. Uh, apologize for going over time. Uh, I wanna wrap up and wanna thank some of our funding agencies who support our work. Um, all of our papers are available online um, and I encourage you to actually play with uh, this really cool uh, in the fairness interface online. Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Uh, it was really great to um, hear about this very useful and important topic in fairness, which is the interaction with stakeholders and this kind of back and forth to come to, to converge to a useful solution. Uh, we'll now roll on to our audience questions. Our first audience question is from Kai Stevenson. Kai, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, yeah, my question is about the kind of last point you made about stakeholder disagreement and how to add yes. that to the theoretical framework. I'm wondering if in your framework, if you just, you know, every time you got auditor feedback, you drew the D from like a random set, what that would do if that would perhaps maybe you would end up maximizing the average of the Ds or what would happen then? Yeah, so our framework don't do, do with different Ds. Uh, so we we assume the, the framework assume there's like a, agree upon D. So this is a strong assumption we overlook. Uh, one, one thing I, I want to say is if you go along the thought experiment you propose, maybe there are different stakeholders, uh, different auditors that come in with their different Ds. Uh, one the third paper I flashed in the beginning of the talk sort of thing along that line, which is somewhat like taking like a, you know, asymptotically over time, taking like a, taking a, like a majority vote uh, of the, the fairness agreements or not. 
and make take take the majority vote that sort of the underlying D. Like uh, in a very abstract way, if like most people think these pairs should be treated similarly, then the the majority will think D is small. Uh, but the framework is a little different, so I I won't go into too too much details now. Yeah, but the short answer is like we the first part of talk don't deal with different Ds. Yeah, and the dis disagreements with it. Yeah. Thanks, Steven. Um, our next question is from Kevin Yao. Kevin, feel free to ask your question. Uh, Kevin, you might be muted. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Hi, Kevin. So, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, first off, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so, uh, so probably touch the uh, the question a little bit, but I'm still a little bit confused about how the auditor works in practice, uh, because of the uh, the 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 challenge to define the distance similarity d, right? So, if I understand it correctly, in the real world task, it's really hard to define the d. Uh, then I'm just wondering uh, if I understand correctly, the auditor actually identifies the fairness violations using the inequality that you mentioned uh, in the definition, right? But that inequality actually it has the uh, you you have to have a definition d in order to define the inequality. So can you clar clar clarify on that? Yeah. So uh, the short answer: this is a strong assumption. Uh, the assumption is the the auditor may never know how to write down the D function. Uh, but whenever the set of the, the pair of decisions are largely going like well above D, uh, they can identify it. So this is a, the a theoretical assumption we make like thinking that uh, this is only a weaker assumption than, than knowing D. Uh, but how much weaker is, uh, I think is up in the air and uh, this is sort of why we actually perform this uh, somewhat ground study of if we really present this kind of interface to people, can they actually spell out this kind of fairness interface or feedback? Uh, yeah, so the short answer to this is like, uh, the auditor doesn't write down the D and we are assuming that they, even without writing down the D, they are still able to catch this kind of way above threshold fairness violation. All right, thank you. Thanks. Our uh, next questions are from Adrian Jalali. Adrian, uh, you should be able to ask your questions. Yeah. Um, you hear me? Yes. Hi, Adrian. Cool. So I have two questions. It's kind of related to one another. The first one is, have you studied um, how presenting different attributes in different forms would impact the auditor's decision on whether or not a decision is fair or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the next one is um, if, if like, I, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, because the theoretical framework um, can deal only with or cannot deal with disagreements, your conclusion from page 31, like when you showed the disagreements was to show only, to use only one auditor so that you don't have disagreements. But wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that if auditors are disagreeing, there is an underlying issue, whether that be on, again, related to the previous question, information they are presented, or just a completely different issue that we need to like, think about and go back and figure out how we are, how we are measuring that um, not disagreement, the, the unfairness? Yeah, so th those are great questions. So, so let me go to the first one uh, first. So you were asking whether the way we present the features to the stakeholders might influence how they respond for fairness feedback. Yes, definitely. Uh, this is, what did not study that. Um, you know, I think there are other work who think about this sort of cognitive biases that might induce by presenting different sort of information. 
Uh, the thing we prioritize here uh, is not how the presentation. So basically, we decided to choose the set of salient features uh, that you know that we think. So they already, as a designer, we already make the decisions that uh, there are more contentious attributes that related to fairness, uh, like uh, such as you know the racial, the demographic background, or the family background relevant to it. Um, but the second question, I think. Uh, perhaps is really getting at the issue. So, so let me clarify. Um, so I do not propose anything concrete in how we solve the disagreement approach. Like, uh, so I, I think I, I wanna make, make it clear that we would come in uh, sort of humble by how hard this problem is. Like, I, I do not propose that we can take whatever we find in the second result and plug into the first paper. Uh, I, I, I think a more fundamental issue is like, we should not just, draw one stakeholder and pick one representative and think that gonna, that's gonna reflect everybody's values. Uh, so I, I just don't think that will work. Uh, and I don't have a concrete way to, to solve that problem. I do think it's a really uh, interesting and challenging problem to tackle, right? So, and it may not be a, a technical question, right? So uh, you could think, draw tools from social choice and think about how we solve disagreement across stakeholders. Uh, you know, there are tools of that and there are impossibility results around that. Uh, I do think uh, in HCI, they, they tend to maybe sometimes take on rather different perspectives. Uh, instead of just having a one-shot procedure to determine some sort of majority vote or some sort of agree outcome, uh, they tend to deliberate or they tend to provide a platform to have people deliberate or negotiate. Uh, and over time, to see whether the, this kind of communication process will actually arrive at a more agreed upon outcome. Um, so which I find is a, a different and, and complementary approach. Yeah, but I, I think you raised a very good point. I, again, I don't, I don't claim that I, this paper, these, these two papers in conjunction provide any concrete solution for really the realistic setting. Yeah. Thank you. So we have just one last question, and I think uh, in the interest of time, let's take this question and finish, wrap up the seminar itself. Uh, so the next last question is from Johnson. Johnson, you should be able to ask your question. Johnson, you might be on mute. Yeah. We can hear you. Yes. Hi, okay. Johnson. Hi. So um, maybe I'm naive, but uh, I would imagine that the case prioritization in, in the child maltreatment system should be governed by policy. Uh, but maybe that's naive, uh, rather than crowdsourced by auditors. So do you see any risks or problems with this, for example, regarding explainability of, of prioritization decisions, or maybe even tendencies to uh, avoid specifying policies in, in, and instead rely on, on, on these kinds of uh, systems being used? So I believe we, perhaps we agree on the same point. I, I, I think, so I think an important point about maybe this talk and some of this work is that these are not arbitrary auditors, they are mechanical turkers. So, so we, we try, definitely try not to do that, even though that's been a common approach in many, much of work. And these are people who actually are at stake. So these are social workers who are really familiar with the child welfare systems. These are parents who may be affected by these systems. And I think the policy decisions should be driven by some of these principles uh, who are affected by assistance. Um, so perhaps I, I'm, I don't think we disagree on that point. Uh, yeah, and, and, but maybe another interesting point that, that may follow up is like, how do you actually select the relevant stakeholders? And how do you actually select diverse stakeholders that actually reflect potentially diverse viewpoints about the issue at hand? Uh, that's also a non-trivial issue that is beyond technical or even machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Johnson. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, Stephen, for answering all the audience questions. And thanks, everyone in the audience, for asking these thoughtful questions. So you, with everyone. that... With that, let's uh, wrap up the seminar portion. Let's wrap up the talk portion of today's seminar. You can use our Twitter thread to continue the conversation uh, if you have any more thoughts. Steven, thank you so much for uh, joining us today for the talk and enlightening us on this uh, very important part of the trustworthy ML discussion. Um, you are welcome to stay on for our participant driven discussion in the next half. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great one. All right. So we are going to take a short break. Um, it should be 117. So we'll take a short two minute break before rolling over to the participant driven discussion, um, which will not be recorded or live streamed. So you can speak your mind. Um, if you are not able to join us for the discussion, we totally understand today's ICML deadline and also a few other deadlines coming up. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time out for uh, this talk. Uh, feel free to uh, connect with us over Twitter, e email us if you have any comments. Our next seminar is also coming up in two more weeks and the speaker will be Celia Sintas from IBM Research Africa. So with that, let's take a little bit of break and reassemble in two minutes in this very link. Thanks everyone.